Um, firstly, um, why don't we introduce ourselves? Um, I'll start. I'm Michael Whitwer, and I'm one of the co-authors on Dungeons & Dragons Art and Arcana. Uh, I'm John Peterson, and I'm coincidentally also one of the co-authors of Dungeons & Dragons Art and Arcana, A Visual History. And I am Kyle Newman, and randomly, I am also one of the authors of Dungeons & Dragons we, we could, Art and Arcana, A Visual History. We can say some other things we did. Mike wrote this amazing book called Empire of Imagination. Hey. Thank you, Scott. Thank you. Thank it's you. It's a very cinematic uh, biography on Gary Gygax and the origins of this game. Well, and I'm going to throw that right back over here. And John Peterson wrote a book called Playing at the World. Okay. Thank you, which was um, really a, a tremendous history of the role-playing game um, hobby from kind of the very beginning to, uh, to now. Yes, and I wrote a small book called Hamlet and... <laughs> I have not written a book yet. This is the first book I've written, and they were kind of uh, my guides into the realm of writing Dungeons & Dragons, which was amazing. But, of course, Kyle also directed a little film called Fanboys that some of you may have seen at one point or another. I'm a filmmaker by, by day. That's what I do. Um, so it was really excellent and challenging to step into this, this totally different world where there's much more immediate results. Um, and tangible results. It's good to have like a book in your hand and create something, and that's what I'm really proud of what we did. So, Kyle. Right there. Well, that's it. Yes. There it is. So, Kyle, let's talk about, um, so why Dungeons and & Dragons and why, why right now? Uh, why come out with a book like this right now? Um, that was, I, I recently got back into Dungeons & Dragons about two and a half, three years ago, and I'd, I'd grown up playing. Um, probably from about the age 10 or 11 onward. My older brothers were very much into it, but I was uh, relegated to the sidelines like Elliot and E.T., and I just had to watch them play. So I would draw the monsters. That's how I learned how to draw that in Marvel Comics. And um, I just became obsessed with the game and all role-playing games in general. And I flirted with them over, over the decades, gotten back into them and out, and I got back into 5th edition and became immediately obsessed again because it's, it's one of the best incarnations of the game. And I said, where is the book on Dungeons and Dragons? Where's the history book? Where's the art book? And there's all these little books. You know, there's great stuff on Art of Dragon magazine and, and different realms. But there was nothing that felt like the, the big, heavy history. And I was always you know, fascinated by the art of it. And I felt like it was you know, something that I wanted to explore. So I couldn't find the book. And that coincided with this, I felt like, a good resurgence in Dungeons and & Dragons and the zeitgeist and people having this desire for analog experience, getting together with friends, around a table, communal storytelling, um, and now Twitch. And there's so many other ways to experience the game. You can watch people play Dungeons & Dragons and it's how it's exploded in the past two or three years. So it felt like this amazing time, and it, we didn't realize it would even reach the apex it is right now when we set out to do this. It was just something that we felt excited about. And that's, that's really the why now. And so I reached out to Michael because I was a fan of his book and I, and I was good friends with his brother. And I floated the idea by him. And John immediately uh, joined our team because John is one, just one of the most foremost experts on, I think, gaming, especially modern role-playing gaming. And Sam was an expert, you know, even though he's an actor by day, uh, uh, Michael's brother. Um, He's, he's a, a Star Wars historian, and he's a real D&D historian. Like, he's obsessed with it. So yeah. we just formed this great team, because I think it needed a team to tackle something as expansive as this. And I mean, who would have thought, right, when we started working on this, that people would be saying 8.6 million people in North America played D&D once a month in 2017? Yeah. And, and that was uh, 2017 statistics, and I think they're already projecting 2018 to be the biggest year ever for Dungeons and & Dragons, and that's usurping years like 1982 and 3, you know, when it was really uh, mainstream. Well, and I, I think one thing that's really um, interesting about today with Dungeons & Dragons um, is that the barrier for entry has been removed. And I think this is one of the most important things that's happening right now. And you see kind of some, some panels we have up there. Of course, you're seeing Stranger Things. That does not hurt the popularity of the game, safe to say, uh, between Demogorgons and, uh, and Mind Flayers. Um, but that's only part of it, right? I, I think the trick with Dungeons & Dragons has always been, how do you explain this game to somebody? Very easy to demonstrate, almost impossible to explain. And we have the benefit now of things like Critical Role and all these streaming shows, including things that Wizards themselves puts on, like what you see there. They're that was Force, uh, Force Grey, yep. and they get, you know, obviously celebrities coming in to play games, people you didn't expect to play Dungeons & Dragons 
coming and playing it online where you can actually see how it's played so it's not as daunting to step into it. So, I mean, you put that together with the, the notion that I want to learn about Dungeons and Dragons, this sounds very cool. Now you can go online and you can figure the game out in 15 or 20 minutes. I think that's one of the biggest things that's happened lately. Well, and also people grew up with these concepts like uh, hit points, experience points, uh, the notion that you get equipment that makes you better and that you level up and like things like that. And these, these were a hump you had to get people over in like the 70s and 80s. And it Characters having like, names, yeah, like oh. giving your character an identity yeah. and picking a race and it, not just being a generic little icon in a video game or a token like a Monopoly piece. It, Dungeons and Dragons took gaming to another level, which has been readily emulated for well, decades but now. But that's the point. But the video games that you just can't grow up now without them being a part of your cultural experience here, they got everyone over that hump too. So, and now the time comes though when you realize you know, the things that are being pushed from the big video game publishers, these games that do $750 million of business in their first day, that's somebody else's story. And once you know how this stuff works, once you've gotten kind of immersed into it, you and your friends can tell the story that only you guys have to like. You can tell your own story. And, you know, I think that the combination of the indoctrination of everyone into the principles of role playing with the amazing job the fifth edition team did with Matt Mercer, with what's going on, with, with all the online stuff, it's just a perfect storm. And that, that's how we're now D&D is bigger than it ever was. Yeah, despite digital advancements, and it's still the only true open, infinite sandbox where anything is possible. There's no digital barriers, there's nothing, and it's still, that feels like that, and that's why the people, I think, are still drawn to it in this golden age of, of video gaming. So to that end, um, one thing that, that occurred to us was that D&D is m much bigger as a cultural phenomenon than, well, than the art would have you believe, for one thing. So when we first got together as a team, one thing we had a lot of discussions about, and frankly, a lot of arguments about, was what does this book look like? i.e., should we divide it up into sections and do a bunch of maps? Should we do characters? Should we do monsters? What, is a, what does the definitive history look like uh, when it comes to you know, the art perspective? And what we figured out was that it was actually very hard to slice the art from the story of the game. And so, John, you want to talk about, about how we conceptualized and how we built the book? Well, I mean, so we decided, we went back and forth, is this an art book or is it a visual history, right? And you can kind of hear in those, those terms a, a slight distinction, I think. A visual history encompasses, first of all, more than just the art. It's, you know, about the, the maps and the character sheets, everything that you would visually experience when you play the game. Even toys, ephemera, patches, posters, advertising, all of that encompassed in it. Even um, electronic games or video yep. games, computer games. I mean, these are important parts of the brand identity. When there are times you can look at, like in the 90s, for example, when video game things like Baldur's Gate were bigger, right, than the tabletop was then. Yeah. And so, I mean, you know, we kind of decided to tackle it by trying to tell the full story of D&D. Now, you know, it's not going to be a laborious uh, academic history when you see this. It's pretty lightweight. There's not a lot of wordage in this book compared to the amount of imagery. It's like seven, 700 or so images. 700 images, maybe right. 50 to 60,000 words. Still plenty on the bone, meat of the bone. But, There's plenty um, of meat on the bone, um, but we definitely decided to try to break it up in a way that what are the major kind of anchors of this history and to kind of show how the people making the game got more sophisticated as time went on, and the expectation of consumers certainly, you know, was towards there being a better product than there was the very inception of the game. But, but we love those early, gritty, garage days of D&D, right? When people are really hashing these concepts out, paying artists $2 an image, $3 an image, because they had an art budget of $100 yeah. for It's fascinating, things you discover, <laughs> probably reading this, a lot of people don't know, um, like the early authors, I mean, the early uh, artists were, one was a, a high school student who was how old? 15? I mean, Greg Bell would have been in his, what, his mid teens, 16, 17 and years Lesh. old. Tracy Lesh would have Doing been. Doing some 14. of the like, foundational creatures, stuff like incarnations of them that still exist today, where they're just variations on what he did as a teenager in high school and Gary getting a good deal on, on, on some art. <laughs> and and uh, the school teacher, um, what's her name? Ed, and, uh, Keenan Powell. Yes. Yeah, Keenan Powell. And uh, the locals, you know, just people that he just had this small little circle of people and he was doing it out of his garage and out of his home and he tapped into the limited resources he had and paid very little dollars to get this artwork and yet we're still talking about these creatures 40 years later, 45 years later uh, in the book. And we kind of take you through the evolution of creatures in subsections called um, uh, either archaeology or evolutions where we, we, we kind of take a creature from its first incarnation and carry it through to fifth edition so you can... You can, when they're next to each other, you can um, ascertain what elements were considered vital as they evolved. Like there's Demogorgon, and you can 
kind of see the how he's transformed, but what are the elements that remain true to Demogorgon and as each incarnation of the game pops up, there's gonna be a new version of Demogorgon in, in the monster manual or you know that you're gonna have to face. So uh, that's what's fascinating and it's the, um, one thing we learned I think early on too was the, that was archeology span and it wasn't just us saying, oh I really like this Dragonlance cover or I really like this art because it was cool. It's what was important uh, what were the transitional pieces, what were the pieces that were game changers in the history of the brand, and having to really dig. So there's the art you can just Google and find online, or there's art you might have seen from a module or a book cover, but a lot of what's on display here is native art. So it's the art before it's been passed on to the printer, before they've doctored colors, before they put UPC uh, codes on them before they've logoed it up. So you can see like these huge spreads and some of it's paintings that people have never seen. Some of the art in this book is stuff that people have rumored to exist. Stuff we found a week before we published. Rumor, people are like that doesn't exist and if it does you should not print that because Gary hated it and it's, and it's in this book. It says, literally says, do not use this ever. <laughs> you know, that's an excellent point Kyle. The, um, now the the art the what we call archaeology or the archaeology of this project was one of the neatest parts of it. Um, before we actually show you some panels, which we're going to do, I, um, I think there's some cool things to talk about this evening and some things that I think you'll be pretty excited to see. I hope um, was that D and D as an intellectual property um, is not something like it came from a big corporation and they kept all the files and they need needed nice in a drawer. Um, nobody knew what this was going to be. This was a homebrew hobby that grew out of wargaming. Um, that had virtually no audience. And as Kyle suggested, the art was done by locals, a lot of local high school people who were paid next to nothing, or in some cases nothing, to do this, these little homebrew doodles. So what's important about it is to think that the fact that any of this stuff still exists is actually a miracle. I mean, think about the, the homebrew doodles you may have done for your own games. That's the kind of level of stuff that somehow got saved and survived history. But it's also not in one place. So one of the biggest parts of this project, one of the most exciting parts of this project was the notion of going to all of these private collections and a gazillion different places to try to locate this stuff. And, the th and those would inevitably lead to the next rock to uncover. Um, John, you want to talk about, at all about that process before we get into some slides? Well, I mean, this is the fun part for me, obviously. Um, you know, I kind of consider myself a collector and archivist of this material, but I, I didn't actually collect art. Um, and, you know, I, I've written a lot about the history of D&D before, but not about the art. What made this a fresh project for me was doing the same methodology that I applied to my earlier work, now to, to the art itself. The good part of being a collector is you learn the opposition, you learn your competitors. And we all kind of know what we have and what we specialize in, and it's a relatively tight-knit community, actually, that collects serious game stuff like this. And so, yeah, fortunately, we had a lot of connections to those people, and we were able to make some pretty amazing discoveries from it. Um, you know, one, one story that um, definitely I, I would tell that was a high point for me was, uh, how many people here know Games Workshop? I say Games Workshop, most people know that. <laughs> what do you know? You know, Ian Livingstone, he's one of the two founders of Games Workshop. Um, as you may know, the uh, d and the people at TSR worked with Games Workshop on the Fiend Folio. And so Ian has the Fiend Folio painting in his house. And I was lucky enough to be able to visit him in, in London. And, you know, we got it out, and I got to take the pictures of it that you can now see. Now you get to see the Fiend That you can see um, in the book, um, which was very, very exciting for me. And, you know, the process, though, can lead you then to all kinds of new finds. And we worked extensively with um, a guy named Matthew Coder, who's probably the foremost collector of D&D art, who has a lot of the Absolutely. crucial pieces. Um, it was a great experience just to be able to go out and, like, find all this Tracking stuff. Tracking down the monster manual, those yep. rumors that Dave Mandel, the showrunner of Veep, who's a, he's a collector of all types of um, pop culture and ephemera, and there's a rumor he had it, so I tracked down him, and sure enough, he had the original Monster Manual painting in all its glory, and it had never been scanned like this with its vibrant colors, without all the, the manipulation on it, so we're lucky enough to have that in here. I think the, the five key pieces of art you're gonna get to see in their full native spread form, which we were lucky to, to capture them all together. Um, also, hanging out with John is pretty amazing because we were up laying out the book in in uh, San Francisco, and we're in the hotel room. We're going through stuff and doing some like cleanup on on things, and and he just happens to talk about this copy of Dungeons and Dragons that someone floated to him that no one's ever seen before, and so he's doing a little archaeology on who actually wrote this draft based on typos, 
based on vernacular? Is it a transition draft? Was this Gary's secretary dictating it? It's a draft that no one knew existed because it's in between two versions of the game. There's, there's just things like that, and he's just sitting on it, and we're like, where are we? I'm not, I hope I'm not sitting on it. I write about this stuff, by the he way. Does, but it's, it's just <laughs> cool nice to watch it. Like it's, it's, even though it's the game's been around and everyone thinks they know the history of it, it's still an evolving, I think it's an evolving thing, I would say. I, I don't feel like it's definitive. There's still a lot of debate about who did, how much did Gary do versus Dave, and there's different opinions on it, and there's different camps. And I think it's people that are entrenched in it based on their relationships from the past, then they made the game, and they made up their mind, and then there's stories that are told that become part of legend. And some of this book is dispelling that and looking at it for the facts as opposed to the feelings and telling a very linear history. So as much as it says it's a visual history and it sounds like it's just an art book, you could pick up this book and know nothing about Dungeons and Dragons, like literally nothing, and you would get the full spectrum of the brand and how expansive it is and what it's done by the end of it and still be able to just open up the book and flip through it purely visually without reading a single word and take you narratively through the story too. So we wanted it to, to be um, accessible on different experiential levels. So if you just want to pick it up and open it up and pick it up and peek at little pages at a time, or if you want to just take it linear, there's so many different ways to experience it, which is a, a part of how we, we spend a lot of time designing it, because I know some people are just casual readers and some people want to just deep dive into the words. So that's what's what's fun about it too. So there, it's both. So if you just if you want real history and you want the story, it's there. And if you just want pictures, man, it's it's definitely there. You know, and one thing I'd like to kind of attack onto that now, as you know, we talked about earlier, um, John and I have been, you might say, D and D historians. I'm not sure if that's a real term, but I've coined it um, for a while. And you know, you think you know a lot about a brand or a game or a history. Um, it would never, it would have never occurred to me to view this game purely through a visual lens. But when you do you learn things about what the brand was doing and the things, the strategy that was happening uh, from TSR and later from Wizards of the Coast that you never would have picked up had you viewed it in, through any other lens. Um, and we're actually gonna talk about a couple of those things and maybe we'll just jump right into it. Go for it. Um, well, John, we're at Comic-Con. So do you wanna talk about... No, pay, pay attention here and look at that uh, image there on the left of that rearing rider. So yeah, I mean, one of the first things I think we'd probably say about the visual look of D&D &D and the sources for its art is that it came from comics. Again, if, you, if who you've got as your artists are kind of like teenage doodlers, people like that, they're reading things like Strange Tales. And you know, this one particular issue of Strange Tales, I believe it's number 169, um, was used by Greg Bell, who was pretty much TSR's first staff artist. The first four books that TSR published, he did he did most of the art for them. Um, and you can see here four different panels from that one issue of that one comic that were adapted into some of the most iconic images. The, the cover of the book was adapted from a Doctor Strange story. Um, and you know, it's from, we, we have that, the fight on gentleman there, um, you know, on the far right, right at the very end of the book. That's the last image that's in original D&D. Um, that's, that's a Nick Fury. And like this is, um, so I mean, it's great to come here to Comic-Con to be able to talk about like where the art of D&D came from, where it started from, um, because of course comics had so much to do with how people thought about the fantastic and the impossible. And Greg Bell, you know, when he corresponded with Gary, they, they lived a, a little distance apart. Um, you know, Greg would say, Gary would give him instructions to do this kind of monster or this kind of image. And he'd be like, I don't know what something like that should look like because there was no you know, accepted visual vocabulary of a lot of these fantastic creatures at the time. And some of these things were brand new, were things that were being kind of purpose-built for D&D. &D. Yep. Um, you know, if you hear hippogriff, okay, you can figure out how you might go to the library and look at a, look at a you know, eagle and a horse and try to, you know, cobble them together somehow. Um, but for a lot of these things, you just had to take what you could. And so Marvel was one of the great original sources for how D&D &D looked. Sorry, DC. <laughs> But there was other inspirations outside of, of course, comic books. There was toys of the time. A lot of people, I think, see these little um, plastic toys that come from overseas and think, oh, look, they ripped off a rust monster. They ripped off an owl bear. It's actually quite the opposite, isn't it? Uh, John, do you, <laughs> you want to talk a little bit about what we're looking at here? 
Well, so, um, yeah, like I was saying, nobody really knew when you would come up with something like an owlbear, what that was supposed to be like. So you can actually see, I was talking about Greg Bell trying to figure these things out. Up in the top left of uh, that panel there, you see a, a bear that has kind of like an owl face on it, <laughs> right? That was Greg Bell's original take on what an owlbear has to be. Um, but by the time the brand started to get a little bit more sophisticated, um, when we got to 1976, 1977, they brought on board a guy named Dave Sutherland. And at that time, they were also playing a lot with these kind of dime store horrors. Now, they'd been doing this for some time, but these three ones that they could, you could just buy them, you know, these little packs that would be labeled like uh, prehistoric animals or something. If you open them up, they're kind of like, you know, booster packs, right? You would get like an assortment of things in them. And that's where you would find things like the rust monster or the boule. Yes, and the boule has E-T-T-E -T -T -E on the end, but you'd still pronounce it boule, not boulette. Um, Gary didn't graduate from high school, if that it wasn't, uh, wasn't clear, but, um, but yeah, so I mean, these then became, by the time of the monster manual, you see a lot of sources being drawn on and being rendered, I might say, with considerably greater fidelity um, right. than you would have in the earlier art as they were now bringing in older, more professional artists. And it's also, what's important is the, the context and the function of it, and a lot of the art was instructional. So you have all this text that's talking about abstract rules, and then you put an image there that was supposed to convey very simply what the mechanic of the game was or what you could do. It wasn't in the book to blow you away with fantasy art. It wasn't supposed to be majestic cinematic imagery. It was just like, oh, here's a guy stabbing somebody in the back. You can steal his treasure. So it was right. very basic. So you're like, oh, I can, I can murder people? Cool. That's how this game works. It's all it was meant to do. And so the context of it was not to be projected big like fine art, it was functional. And that's what's interesting too, is looking at how it's evolved, because you look at what's going on in fifth edition, and I think that's probably one of the, the best incarnations of art. And they tell stories, and you're, you're in a moment, you're in a scene in a film, and it feels like action just happened. You know, fourth edition has its own vibe, where it's, they're trying to compete with video games, and people are doing like impossible flying, stab you in the back of the neck moves, and you're like, What's this? Every, every edition had its own way of, of conveying it, but the early, early stuff, it was function. And I think that's what's cool is looking at it for what it was as opposed to, you know, what we'd, what we'd want to put up in a gallery, you know? Well, and one thing I'll um, kind of jump on the back of that, which is simply that consider that those Marvel panels we looked at, consider something like this. Distribution was such that this was, this was homebrew art. This was never actually meant to be seen by any major group. And they probably wouldn't have done things that way if they had ever thought that, um, well, for example, I mean, you know, D&D ran into some early trouble with the Tolkien estate because they had used things like hobbits and ents and things like that. Um, Oops, yeah, they got, they got slapped down on well, that. So they had to change terminology and also had to evolve the visualization of creatures. You know, D&D has new creatures. It has its own beholders and mind flayers and things like that, but it also, you're capitalizing on orcs, dragons, and very classic fantasy creatures. So unicorns, everything has, there's a, there's a classic fantasy base to it, and then there's very D&D specific. So and speaking it's finding their footing in that. D&D specific, the displacer beast we have here. Um, well, there's a couple things of note here, I think, um, that are kind of worth talking about. So this is, of course, the cover from the basic box. We were lucky enough to shoot that at Wizards. They actually own this painting to this day. Famous Dave Sutherland painting, one of their uh, earliest and kind of best known staff artists of that era. Um, it's notable for a number of reasons. It's full color, which was not something they were doing a ton of at this point. Um, it's painted on oil. Um, and it's very instructional, as Kyle was talking about. So here you've got something that shows you Here's the front of this box that's supposed to introduce people to this game. And it's effectively showing you, well, it's got dungeons, it's got dragons, it's got, it's got an eclectic group of characters going to fight uh, the dragon. So it really is quite instructional. It tells you an awful lot about what you're in for here. It's letting you know wizards are, uh, it's totally fair to wear your pajamas into combat. Yeah. <laughs> he put on his robe and wizard hat, obviously. Exactly. Um, I, I mean, and this is an important part of the game for a lot of reasons, one of which is that um, I mentioned that instructional part because the basic set, I mentioned today how easy it is to be able to learn this game. This was one of their first big attempts to try to bring in new people into the game. So this was a particularly important piece um, from an art standpoint, from a product standpoint. And I did mention the Displacer Beast, I did open that, that, um, that door. So, what you see there in that picture, which is pretty neat, um, that is a draft page from Eric, uh, J. Eric Holmes's 
basic draft. He's the one that, that was the one that pieced together uh, this particular edition of the game. Um, and that is an illustration, if I don't destroy it, that is an illustration by uh, Christopher Holmes, his son. When he sent Gary these pages, Christopher Holmes had drawn all of these different creatures on the pages. And that's, to our knowledge, one of the first known depictions, perhaps the first known depiction of the Displacer Beast. Roughly 1976, in this case. And, and you wonder, why, why didn't they use it? Wouldn't, wouldn't that have been great to see that? And, uh, eh, but. Yeah. All right, moving on. Let's go here. So we're on to 1E now. We're on to advanced Dungeons and Dragons. We've gotten through the basic stage. D&D is starting to grow. It's starting to become a real thing. Um, and they start hiring some, some artists that had some training to start doing the, the covers of their books. They also start printing hardcover books that are full cover, color rather. So you see that here. As, I, as you saw in the beginning, we were happy to be able to find actually all of these wraparound covers. Now, if you've ever sat and poured over these D&D books, as I think we all did as kids, I think we all probably wanted to see what the painting looked like. Well, the painting is long gone in the respect that it was never kept in one place, but um, we were lucky enough to track down a lot of these people that had them. Yeah, did, does anyone here go to Gen Con? Any hands up? Anybody see the museum last summer at Gen Con, which I curated? Um, so, yeah, we, ha we actually had that there. Um, last year, so you could have seen the original of it. That, this, this is one, uh, I would say this is one of the easy ones, right? Like the Monster Manual, that was a tough one. Uh, you had to go to London to get the Fiend Folio. There's like, uh, yeah, some of that was tough. So we're talking about visuals. Some people even claimed to have them and didn't really <laughs> and strung us along. Crazy. We're not going to name names or point yeah, fingers that's or correct. shame anyone publicly. And that's these correct. Things, these things exchange hands at pretty big sums of money now. I mean, I think... You know, Monster Manual was probably purchased at a very small price, but now what, it's gone up probably quite a lot, hundred times. <laughs> quite a lot. Yeah. Um, so when you talk about the kind of the visual evolution, again, we'll try to stay in our lane there. I mean, yeah, there's a million things, of course, we could talk about. You can tell we're excited about it. Um, Satan. Yes, one of them. <laughs> Satan. <laughs> so we, we just we just showed you a giant devilish red ifrit, um, you know, fighting some adventurers near the city of Brass in the Plain of Fire. It looks like. It kind of looks like hell, right? It kind of looked like a demon in hell. It didn't, it didn't look so great. Well, imagine being a parent in roughly 1978, 1979 rather, and picking up that book and seeing it in your kid's room. It might be concerning for many, many reasons. Um, that parent was a very interesting incident that happened in 1979 that I'll let one of my colleagues kind of give you the, the high level on. Something that we mentioned because this is a particularly important thing about how it affected the visualization of the game. I mean, does anyone here not know about James Dallas Egbert, the steam tunnels, the whole story of this? I see hands up. Good. That's good. About good. Tom good. Hanks about and it. Mazes and Monsters. Tom Hanks and Mazes and Monsters. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, we'll get there. So, yeah, I mean, D&D might have remained a pretty niche thing. Games like this didn't have a clear path to the mainstream. There was no mainstream audience for them, as Mike was saying. I mean, a lot of this were originally like war gamers who played this. No, it had gotten pretty big by 79. But, you know, we're talking about a game that did maybe a little less than a million dollars a year in business, right, um, for TSR. But then just this thing happened in the summer of 1979 where a kid named James Alice Egbert went missing from his, his university. And a big deal was made about this. Um, there was a bit of press. Some people were brought in, including a private detective, William Deere, um, who championed this theory that, in fact, Egbert was lost in the steam tunnels beneath the college, playing some live action version of the game and that he was probably dead. Maybe the first LARPing ever. Well, among the first, well, you know, I think he got confused. He talked to some people who knew the SCA existed and he wasn't real clear on what the difference was between the SCA and D&D, but anyway. Really, he was in Daytona. Yeah, <laughs> That's yeah, yeah. Break. <laughs> well, yeah. Well, so he was in Louisiana, yeah. So it just turned out that Egbert had gone for unrelated reasons to Louisiana, but nobody knew this for weeks and there was this period where just on a daily basis there were these, these headlines about this deadly game, this cult that was killing college students. And, you know, because there is no such minutes, thing. It became right. a national story about the, the dangers of the game. Which and, you know. Obviously, no, pre no, and no press is bad press. And yes, exactly. D &D, it exploded the game into the national consciousness. And, you know, although the initial reports about it were very negative, for some reason that doesn't really discourage teenagers from getting involved in things. When the mainstream media, the fake news is telling you the that... The human sacrifice yeah. in the top right up there is, is a, a, a popular one with parents in the late 70s. So you can imagine, once this type of um, scrutiny has been placed on the game, media scrutiny, and again, by the way, 
So as they suggested, Egbert shows up, he's fine, it's got nothing to do with the game, but that's a story that was not widely reported on the back end, right? So now it's in the public conscious that there's something weird about this game. So you carry that forward to imagery that looks like this in your books. All of a sudden, again, Dungeons & Dragons has an interesting problem, but also an interesting opportunity. So firstly, the revenue goes from roughly, what, about a million dollars a year it quadruples in about a year's time after that incident. Um, not unrelated, they got a lot of free press as a result of this, of this um, kind of media frenzy. But the other part is that it placed a new level of scrutiny on the game that it didn't have before. So all of a sudden now you've got a lot of nervous parents who are reading the news. That article we showed you is from the New York Times. And they go home, they look at their, their children's books, and they th see things like that. This does not play well with uh, the mainstream audience, especially areas that were more religiously inclined. So uh, TSR had a problem on their hands as they were trying to grow this brand. Now they were selling books, but they weren't the kind of books you could buy at Walden Books or Kmart. So they, they did something pretty interesting, which is they, they, um, they kind of softened their image. They went from imagery that looks like on the left there Happy in about a year's time to the imagery on the right. That's morally the wizard there on the right. Like it's a direct cute. response to satanic panic. How cute yeah. and friendly he is. Good old morally. Very welcoming. Leading your children to a <laughs> land of adventure. And that one was. thing that's really great about uh, the book and what you know, I think these guys were really able to uncover was um, advertising as a subplot, watching the way the brand would sell its product and choose to be visually identified. So you can really trace over, I mean, how many ads do we have in there? Lots of ads. I, I know we wanted like 200, but I think we got uh, 75. Oh, a lot, yeah. We have a lot of ads. Yeah, so it's, it's an advertising as a subplot, which I think is an important way of looking at the game. So it's not just module covers, it's also how does this brand choose to present itself to the public, and like contrasts like this are, are fascinating as how you react to the public. And what's also fascinating is CBS, who's kind of spearheading a lot of the lampooning of the brand, is also the one producing the Tom Hanks Mazes and Monsters. Uh, so while they're making fun of it and criticizing it on, on their, in the media, they're then making movies of the week, and they're also the ones producing and releasing the animated series, making money off kids. So it all became a money machine, so you take it down and also uh, monetize it. It doesn't really matter, ultimately, if the story of James Dallas Egbert and the steam tunnels was false, because the narrative was, like, too much fun for people to give up on it. And you decided to transpose it then into mazes and monsters and various other similar things that, are, that have exactly the same argument structures as the arguments about video games causing violence and everything else. I would say the game's last peak before where we're at right now in D&D uh, in &D history was probably, like, E.T. era 1982, it being emblazoned there on, in a Spielberg film. Um, you know, everyone remembers the opening of E.T. and these kids are playing Dungeons and Dragons with precursory Dwarven Forge type miniatures on the table. <laughs> um, and that's, it's interesting to watch the way the brand evolved in public, you know, from Stranger Things now to being in E.T. back then. So one thing that we thought was really important to cover, of course, was not just art, not just ads, not just news, but of course, ephemera and toys and all the other good things that you can, you can kind of think about. Um, so again, we, we went to a lot of trouble to really uncover some really, really great stuff. And again, it wasn't good enough just to get toys or unwrapped toys. You can see here you've got some interesting conceptual imagery based on the toys and then the toys next to them. So this is the kind of level of detail we wanted to kind of give you um, in, in kind of single shots. Um, so I think we um, did some good stuff there, I think. Um, I'm trying to think what else we may want to cover given we have 15 minutes. We do want to take questions as well because there's yeah, so much to show and so much to talk about. You guys have questions? Yeah, yeah go for it. Yes, you can line up there too if you want. Yeah. If you want to ask questions, and we run out there, we'll, we'll raise hands. Um, so Mike Merles had a post last week about uh, for AD and D second edition, the the uh, Golden Girls were a source of inspiration. <laughs> I, I mean, that seems to tie into the image, right? Because for us now, the classic party is the tank, damage dealer, healer. That and that goes across. Um, do you guys go into that as well and how the evolution of like what a party is supposed to be or what a, yeah. We definitely get into the, the types of classes, the roles they played, the restrictions on classes, you know, with uh, in third edition finally being able to do like a half-orc paladin and classes being opened up to different genders, classes being opened up beyond your levels of strength and caps on them. There's like a, 
also visually how they evolved. I think in all the depictions within the books, you'll see they, they tried to balance the parties. So you'll see most of the group shots and character building right here. You'll see what they, um, you know, the, the, the famous one on the, on the left up there. Where's the one with the, the, the one that looks like Michael Jackson? <laughs> 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 that one's great. Yeah. Um, but you can see they, they kind of balance it all shapes and sizes in a party. But I think it's, it's very astute what, what Merle's is saying and that's, that is a big part of it. And that's something like, I think a lot of people brought to it. Um, the books don't really tell you to optimize your party. I think that's something that players kind of gamed. So, but it is something that, that's just part of the history. It's like in eight, you want to have a cleric, you need your healer, you want to have your tank, you want to have a, a caster, and you need somebody with area of effect spells. That's something that like, I think optimizers put into it less than you know, Perkins is trying to stress in the game book, like optimize your party. I think they want you to try different classes and go against the grain, don't do the half orc barbarian, do something different. Um, but it is a key part of it. And I think in all the depictions you'll see when they do do a party, they're totally balanced like that. And we do talk a bit actually in, about fourth edition and about the way that it appropriated from MMOs, the, <laughs> these real very direct concepts of, of roles. And um, the fact that they have those kind of support roles versus damage dealing roles versus leadership kind of roles, um, that is a big part of the, well, there's a back and forth, right, between D&D &D and video games that went on forever. And um, I th certainly think the, the notion that you build parties that way probably is more indebted in some respects to things that followed Ultima 3, to JRPGs from that era. Um, and then they got just blown up through the MMO um, enthusiasm when that all started. Although five clerics would kick ass. Five clerics. It would. It would. Five original clerics would be a party. Five zero and, and that's a fourth edition panel I put up, by the way, to kind of show you what the game was mechanically functioning like. It was this, essentially a tabletop game that was emulating the capabilities in an MMO, if that makes sense. The, the idea, the, the customization you could build into some of these things. And what's great is fifth edition is the, the era where they finally said, you know what, we don't need to compete with video games. We don't need to compete with the digital. We are our own thing. Let's be our own thing and let's let the game be front and center as opposed to trying to chase what other people are doing or react to what other people are doing. And this goes into a lot of that. There's a lot of reaction to what's happening with rival games once they open sourced it and people started to encroach upon their territory with, with other RPGs and other settings. Um, kind of backfired a little bit and then they over moduled themselves and overwhelmed themselves to the point where they were competing against themselves and they weren't making the all that stuff gets into so it's always a reaction to uh, what's out there what their competitors are doing and then how they're going to position themselves for the next edition and yeah. please uh, so obviously the history of the art of D&D is visual given technology and things like that but very recently I think the um, the art of d and is now merging as a performing art and a visual art. Can you talk about that a little bit? It's, it's absolutely a, a direction it took about two and a half, three years ago, which I don't think the brand itself um, even anticipated, but it's something they've harnessed. Obviously, it's something that's very difficult to put into uh, visual form here. We do obviously... Matt Mercer is a, is a very good friend of the book and he gives us a great uh, blurb and he's read it and uh, liked what he's seen and w he's having great conversations and critical role, like that's a playoff of a very early ad. Um, it's, a v it's very much a part of where the brand is right now and it's gonna be an even bigger part of where the brand is going. And in our last chapter, we definitely get into where the brand is going, but like I said, it, it is in its nascent stages. It's always been about uh, role play. There's always been a performance element, but now that you're seeing more actors, more voice actors and people taking to the format and it becoming something that people wanna watch at conventions, something that people wanna watch online, something that you don't just play, but now you're gonna watch it on your off nights. It's changed, the, it's changed what the brand is. And I think that's, that's something we talk about in here. It's a, it's a big part of it. But it's, since it's so new, it's not something we can go very much into detail on. It's almost like we, we talk about the people that are doing it and how that's changed the game and how they've monetized it and how they've harnessed it. Things like Force Gray, um, that's part of what they're doing right now and how they're showcasing their new product and things like the streams they've been doing. Uh, but it, yeah, we don't have it 
heavily visually represented in here because it's it's really a, it's a, like a breathing format you got to watch. So, but that's a that's a very good point, and that's what's exciting I think about it. That's why it's found its new audience. You do have these old school people, and then you have this whole new generation of people that have found it in the past three years. How many people play, have played the Dungeons and Dragons? Yeah, amazing. Good. Yes. How many people have never played Dungeons and Dragons? All right. Nice. Yeah. Hey, good. Welcome. Yeah. Welcome. Wow. You'll still love our book. I now, promise. How many people? Okay. But, um, but how we've, many we've, people have watched Dungeons and Dragons on Twitch or online? Uh, See, a lot. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. And I think if you asked that question five years ago, people would have looked at yeah. all of us like we were crazy. And now, you know, if you don't make your saving throw, it's a Twitter storm. Yeah. <laughs> right. Good point. Some people. So are yet that's. Point, you know, we hope to do more, more books, and I think that's that's an it's an important. Um, area of the game, that's a good question. Yeah, if you all buy the book, then I guarantee <laughs> there will be... And tell your friends about the book. Also, if you want to see the book, uh, you can come to the, the, the Penguin Random House Crown booth. Uh, it's 1500, 1515. 1515, I believe. And you can flip through this. It's going to be there the rest of the weekend. And tomorrow we have an event at Bait, um, which is five, 920 uh, Fifth Avenue, and we're going to have the special edition there. That's from 4 to 7 tomorrow, so you can come by there. We can we can talk. You can flip through the special edition, and the special edition is, it's insane what's in there. We should we should talk about that after this question, but Please. you can see that tomorrow and hold it and flip through it. Uh, hi. Uh, Jeff T. did a lot of the work in the earlier editions, D&D and uh, AD&D. He ran some successful Kickstarters to recreate the art because it was destroyed. In your investigations, do you find any of his art or any of the other lost art? Yes. Well, no. So I, yeah, <laughs> we, we, we do have some of his art in there. Um, I'm thinking of the thing that's on back of uh, Queen of the Demon Web. That's right. That's a good example. Um, the native art still survives of, of his material, not, not as much as I'd like. Um, I mean, we have all kinds of things that are variants that weren't used, for example, conceptual sketches, things like that. And some of that material is, I think, quite interesting if you're a historian. There's also like Gary's it. handwritten notes, like this is what Tiamat should look like. This is what a beholder is that he would pass on to an artist. So you're seeing this is what he handed them, and then they went and visualized it and turned it into this just based on Gary's words. That stuff's really fascinating to watch how it's conceived. Do you have a follow-up on that? Because there's someone at the mic, but... Yeah. Hi. Menu. Sorry to change the subject, kind of tangential question. For you guys as visual historians of the game and of the brand, uh, how do you feel about the really sharp evolution into the digital media? You know, D&D uh, &D Beyond, Roll20, stuff like that. Roll20. Hey. For me, it's, it's exciting, but I think why the game is still around is because there's an, uh, people have an affinity for the analog. People have an affinity for getting together with your friends. Yes, you can finally play the game in a digital setting. You can play with a friend in Australia, or you can play with a friend in another city, and you can get your group together, but you're using technology to play the game as meant to be played, as opposed to taking the game and translating into a video game. That's what's exciting, is technology is being harnessed in a way so the game retains its foundational qualities. Um, I think it's it's great because it's only doing good things. It's exposing more people to the game. It's dispensing a lot of myths and taboo about the game. Um, you realize that, wow, I can just show up and kind of roll dice and learn it on the go. I don't have to master this huge book. So instructionally, it's very important that people can watch it. So I think it's exciting. Um, we had you. Did you want to finish your question before we... Oh, we have a section on Otis... Otis for me is like the, uh, I said he's like the El Greco of Dungeons and Dragons art. Um, he's a particular favorite of ours. We have a whole Otis section. We talk about, um, you know, Otis actually submitted into Dragon Magazine a, a depiction of a creature into a contest. And there's like some really fascinating stuff about Otis. So there's a lot in here about foundational, important artists, I would say. And, so. and we had the opportunity to meet with him a few times. I interviewed yeah. Errol myself. You know, I thought Errol would be much more kind of psychedelic and trippy. and Because you know, he grew up in Berkeley, right? Yeah. Well, yeah. And so he went to Berkeley High School in the 1970s. But he insists to me that never did he encounter any illicit substances of any kind until he got to Lake Geneva. <laughs> and Lake Geneva it was constant, not Berkeley, mm -hmm. California. That was apparently where you got turned into a drugged out hippie. This is the, 
anyway. Now, Errol's great. We actually have in the end papers of the book, the back end paper is, uh, is his Shelton Graf, actually. Yeah. We interviewed, um, I want to say, I don't know, 25 or 30 exclusive interviews with everyone we could find, literally anyone that would talk to us. That was a huge part of this. All the key people, are, in, are I'd say, are in this book in some fashion. Yeah. Statement and a question. Statement, awesome. Question, I haven't seen much art since second edition. How would you describe or typify how it's changed third, fourth, fifth edition? It's an interesting question. I mean, certainly very recently, and the, to the earlier question, it's become more digital. That is, a lot of this art is no longer actually done on, like, you know, canvas. Um, and yeah, you want to speak to this, to the in-world. Well, right, yeah, so uh, second edition, you know, through the 90s, you basically had um, a continuation of... Well, there's a lot of good reasons this, for this, but a continuation of high-level 80s fantasy art, uh, which I think at TSR was some of the best out there, really. I mean, some of the people that were doing this art, Larry Elmore, Jeff Easley, these were some of the best in the business. Um, and it's no wonder that that tradition ch carried through the 90s because people like Jeff Easley continued to do almost all of the, the hardcover fronts for almost all of the books. So it was the same artist literally doing them from roughly 1983 to 1996. Um, but when you get around 2000, this is, of course, after Wizards uh, acquires Dungeons & Dragons, that's when things change quite a lot. And, of course, the game is changing rapidly at this point. Where, where'd, which, the arc, where'd the art go, Michael? Well, exactly. So this notion of in-world design, this, this idea of buying a book that doesn't have any traditional fantasy artwork on it, it looks like actually an in-world tome, an in-world magic book that you might buy. Um, so, I mean, to answer the original question, um, the game goes through lots of really interesting um, iterations beyond that point. I mean, almost at, at this point, you get into a digital realm. Almost everything beyond this has created um, some combination of digital or, you know, there's, there are still some physical paintings, but it changes an awful lot over the last, what, in, 17 in years. In style, say fourth edition, it goes more sensational colors, much more dynamic angles, angles that emulate video game angles. They're actually trying to use this uh, literary game to compete with the video game. And that was one of the one of the the, you know, the pitfalls of what they were doing with fourth edition, fifth edition. Like I said, it tries to go a little more timeless and cinematic, and they they're they're trying to capture um, moments in a story as opposed to moments of action. So there's looks and feels that become synonymous with each era. We get into all of that. We get into the style of art, the colors, the definitely the methods they use to paint. Um, evolutions of characters, like we said, you're going to see all of that when you see them all next to each other, you realize like each era has like, it's like clothing, it's like TV shows, everything has a flavor for the era that's part of it, zeitgeist stuff, and that's all, you know, we, we dissect it, and that's what the, the group of us could do, we could say, this is important, oh, I saw this in it, and then it led to a conversation, and it wasn't just, here it is, and check it out, it became a deep conversation that then migrated onto the page, so we were really able to analyze, deep dive, intellectualize and also just emotionally react and that's what's 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 awesome about it. I mean this was like a, a true passion project for us all because the game is so important to us all and it's important to probably everybody in this room so we're like we have to do justice to this and it's got to be something that we want to be definitive we didn't put definitive on there but I think I feel like we we didn't leave many stones unturned in our in our quest. We'll leave it to you to tell us if it's definitive or not. That's right. Uh, that's right. The journey took a couple of years and it felt pretty pretty long. Uh, but so big picture, if if you loved, you know, I, I resonate this idea that you know I haven't followed it since second edition. Um, that became a big problem um, with D and D by roughly 2010, where they started coming home again. They they started trying to appeal to the people that hadn't played the game since second edition or first edition. Um, even this particular example is a good one. On the left there, you see the original 1983 red box, very famous Larry Elmore cover. On the right there, uh, immediately right of it, I should say, is the 2010 starter set. That's a fourth edition product that they're basically saying, hey, you remember us? I know the game's changed a lot, but come home. We're, we're just like that one in the, in the past. Um, they did a lot of soul searching uh, at that fourth edition point where they really tried to find what their base was, um, what they wanted to be. And I think that's where 5th edition kind of started as a, as a jumping off point. And I think that's one reason 5th edition's been so successful, um, is that it really considered everything that came before in a way that the game uh, had not between, say, 3rd, 3.5, and, and then 4th. And, then and it's fourth. international, too. There's a global game. It started as an American phenomenon, but it's global. So we also get into the international editions, alternate covers, how creatures were drawn differently in Japan versus here. There's all of that in this book. So. It's got a much wider 
vantage than just looking at it through North American and then you know tr the, the publishing here that they did through through Penguin themselves. So it's um it's global and that's an important part of the conversation too. So we could talk all night about this. We have time for one more question. That's you. So. Go okay, for it. so you guys, this is a big passion project for all of you, but at the end of the day, the book can't be like infinite pages long. What were some things that you wanted to delve deeper into that just couldn't fit in this one? Wow, there, well, there was a lot of brutal cuts at the end. There, there was. It's almost, it was almost front heavy because all of the early stuff is so important and we wanted to go deeper and deeper. John and Michael, we all wanted to just keep expanding it. It all had to keep a shape then that felt uh, even, even though the first, the, the importance, the early stuff is important because you need that to establish it so you can have those later conversations about how it evolved. I think a deeper dive into the TSR years, into interior mo module art, stuff we couldn't put in, more covers, and also uh, not just the bigger, broader history, but creator stuff like the evolution of famous storylines things like that that's in there but you can go deeper that's what i i want to do a sequel book i want to do more we want to do a lot more wow. it would be deeper dives into yeah i mean i the thing that breaks my heart that we didn't get to do more of really was um community generated material um things that were made by the fans and i think there's just an amazing amount of that material out there we, we managed to get in like a couple examples of like uh, art that had been done like maps have been done relatively recently um but uh there's so much amazing artwork so much uh, so many amazing ideas that kind of came out of the fan community um and and kind of games that were adjacent or variant things unofficial kind of bootleg things i'm sure we could have gotten the rights to them but it's this is really trying to be that you know, core story of D&D &D as a brand, and that's what broke my heart. Well, and there were 700 plus images in the book. It's a 450 page book. It's, it's pretty massive. Um, and I'm, I'm just going to say it, if, if you like D&D, &D, you will love this book. I, I do believe that. Um, and I, I mean, I say that very sincerely. I don't. And if you don't, get it anyway. It Whatever. Is. Yeah, buy it for a friend that Why likes not? D&D. I mean, uh, for the price point too, I mean, look at how thick that is. 440 pages. It, it's, it's basically it's the same got price point. Like by, by you, guys, you guys know Joe Manganiello. Joe is a huge D&D &D fan. He's got his new Death Saves brand Death of, saves. of uh, D&D streetwear. Joe's got the forward. There's so many friends of the brand that we, we get into in the book. And it's, I think it's, it's one of the most exciting times for the brand. So, But my point was... What's in the special edition? Oh, the special edition. Okay, we'll give you the special edition. Let's let go. Sam answer Okay. It. So um, we had well over 2,000 images that were on our final list. 700 make the cut. So to give you a sense, there was... There was literally over a thousand things that we, we couldn't use that we wanted to, but it also gives you a sense that we really spared no expense at getting the best of the best of the best. Um, when it came to the special edition, here's, here's kind of what that's about. Um, we were able to reproduce, gosh, this is a long story, but we're going to make it super short because they're going to kill us here. Thank you. Really um, quick, really quick. So uh, in 1975, Gary Gygax ran a module at Origins Baltimore, Origins 1, called Tomb of Horrors. It was a tournament module. Yeah, exactly. It was a tournament module, and it was meant to be extremely lethal. Why? Because it was a tournament module. It was actually meant to come out with kind of defined winners, so you need to be very deadly. Um, that original module um, is about, I'm going to say, what, 40 pages, John? A little less, but yeah. A little bit less than 40. Different art, everything. Um, so we were able to, and I should say, really, this is a John, this is a John thing right here. Uh, he was able to uncover an original copy of the Tomb of Horrors, which has alternate panels by a young 14-year-old artist named Tracy Lesh, the same panels uh, that describe the same things that you see in the 1978 published version by Trampier and Sutherland, but these are three years earlier. And this has got Gary's handwritten notes, um, his own typewritten pages. And it's published in full, so you get the whole module in the special edition, along with posters, um, basically frameable art. It's loaded with stuff, and it's a Hydro 74 uh, special edition cover. Uh, and he does a lot of the special edition D&D stuff. It's got this heavy clamshell. It's the book inside is, is a totally different cover. So that's all limited edition. And like I said, all the, the inserts and stuff are pretty astounding. And there's also, do we, does there talk about the other one or no? No, we, 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 we got to <laughs> yeah. stop. They're, they will kill us if we do not. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you very much.